Okay, welcome back. And I might do the acknowledgement to country again. So we acknowledge the traditional owners of the unceded land on which we work, learn and live, the Wurundjeri, Wurrung and Bunurong peoples. We recognise the unique place held by Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples as the original owners and custodians of the lands and waterways across the Australian continent with histories of continuous connection dating back more than 60,000 years. We pay respect to elders past, present and future and acknowledge the importance of Indigenous knowledge systems in this university. So our second panellist, a lot of panellists, we're just trucking them in and spitting them out. Um, we're here to pretty much talk a little bit about career paths and career path strategies. And um, I am pleased that we have Michael Roper, who is from Architecture Architecture, but now the chair of our Masters of Architecture Advisory Committee. We then, next to him, we have the wonderful Stephanie Bullock, who is a director of um, Kozlov Architecture. And I also understand you've rushed here tonight from the Victorian Chapter Council. So thank you so much for coming over because I know how exciting that <laughs> venue would have been. And then we have um, Sui Chi Shen from Roth Lohman, who is actually one of our uh, graduates. And um, I think Sui Chi will tell us a little bit about her career path. Then we have the wonderful and amazing Sonia Sarangi, who is a director of Endeavour and may be well known to some of you as a tutor here and is also a graduate of um, here. And then at the end, we have Robert Polglaze, who has had many, many years of um, experience and quite an interesting career path and um, tutors here in architectural practice amongst other things. So I think we might start with you, Michael, because um, you're closest to me. Um, I think in a few words or maybe a few sentences, how would you describe your career path? And I remember meeting you in Berlin. So that was obviously part of it. Yeah. Um, in a few sentences, my career path, I uh, graduated from Melbourne University, but spent a couple of years um, studying in Stuttgart through the midsection of that and established a bit of a uh, connection with Germany. Um, came back to Australia as an undergrad, worked at Hassel for a couple of years, um, moved across to Stoughton Architects, James and Stephen Stoughton, they were brothers in practice. Um, before they parted ways uh, and then um, spent a couple of years there uh, which was bridged kind of pre-graduation post-graduation um, moved across to BKK where I worked with Steph uh, for three years um, and then went to Berlin which is where we caught up uh, to help establish um, the ANCB campus um, it's like a, um, an international campus for universities all over the world to kind of come together and research uh, and undertake design studios. And then came back from there and started my own practice essentially while working at workshop architecture um, a few days a week to get kick started. Um, and then, yeah, I've been in practice um, with my business partner now for 12 years. Right. More than a few sentences, but it's... It is more than a few sentences. And workshop architecture in Staunton, that would have been a good training ground, do you think? I, th I would have thought so. And even, of course, BKK. Even, of course, BKK. Even, of course, BKK. Yeah, um, they were great training grounds. Um, <coughs> I was very conscious, and it's probably the advice I'd be wanting to give today, I was very conscious of where I wanted to go um, as an architect where I where I thought I saw myself going, uh, which was I always wanted to start my own practice. That was a little bit of a given for me. I don't think that's for everybody, but I knew that's what I wanted. Um, and very consciously worked in practices that 
uh, felt like they looked like what I thought my future practice might look like or what I wanted it to look like. Um, and at a scale that was small enough where I felt like I would be exposed to um, the workings of a practice so that I could understand that for myself as well. It was really an opportunity to make mistakes on other people's time and money, um, <clears throat> which is you know, a great way to think about <laughs> your early years straight out of university. You do have the safety net of your employer, uh, which is kind of necessary coming out of uni because you don't really know, you know the trouble you can get yourself into um, quite until you see it play out a few times. Um, and yes, um, those, those practices were great training grounds. Um, they were all really um, uh, quite open, transparent, communicative practices where you were seeing the inner workings, um, uh, you know, quite clearly uh, and certainly made it easier for me to imagine what starting a practice might be. Tiffany, yeah. how, how did you come to be on the Victorian Chapter Council? <laughs> uh, somebody encouraged me to put my name forward. Right. But it certainly wasn't something um, that I intended to do. Uh, but before that, um, becoming an architect, again, not something I intended to do. I could probably describe my uh, career trajectory as somewhat unusual. Uh, I did not study architecture when I left school. I did a Bachelor of Commerce and I then spent 10 years working in banking. And then I realised that I did not want to be a banker. I had a baby and then I started my architectural degree when I was 30. Uh, so I came to architecture very late. Uh, I started working in my first practice, BKK, when I was in third year. Uh, I honestly didn't know anything about them. I literally saw a sign on the wall at RMIT and put my application in and, and I got the job. And I stayed there for 13 years. Uh, from a student, I ended up becoming a director and a shareholder and then decided um, for a variety of reasons that I would like to try something different. So I then joined an engineering firm that a friend of mine had founded. Uh, after a year, they asked me to be a director and I became a shareholder there. And in the meantime, BKK demerged and one of the founding directors asked me if I would like to start a practice with him. So I thought, why don't I do that as well? So I did. So <laughs> I spent a year when I was both the director of an engineering firm and a director of an architectural practice and then at a certain point realised that I had to choose and I finally chose architecture. That's amazing. I didn't realise all that, particularly being a mature age student at that toughest, <laughs> most <laughs> critical negative of architecture schools in all of Christendom, RMIT. But I think, did your commerce degree really help you have different or more, you know, in different insights into practice that other people may not have had? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question, although I must be honest to start with, it felt like a deep, dark secret that I had to, to not <laughs> reveal to anybody. I know in my interview for RMIT, they were very <laughs> suspicious of yeah, me. I hope you didn't mention it then, you <laughs> no, did. No, I, I did, I did. Oh, and and then, suspicious. of course, the fact that I had a nine-month-old baby as well, I mean, they thought I was deeply inappropriate. Anyway, somehow I got in as well. Um, but yeah, it was very strange, because I did find a lot of people were quite... Um, it just didn't seem quite right. I think things have changed now. I must admit, I dumbed down my initial CV and application to make it sound like I was sort of a glorified executive assistant rather than a senior banking executive. I wouldn't advise you do that now. But I think certainly um, now on reflection, it has been incredibly valuable. And if there is one piece of advice I would give to you is find something that differentiates you. So my commerce degree and my finance experience and my experience in engineering makes me very, very unusual. And it's been enormously helpful to me throughout my career. So for me, I think that's that's been something that's really, um, I've, I've been very conscious of, but the more time goes on, the more valuable I realise that is. Sweet Chi, you're, maybe you're the most recent graduate here. When did you graduate? About four or five years ago? Um, yeah, I graduated 2018, end of 2018. And my career is like a straight line. After I graduated, I went to a um, um, big firm who doing multi-residential buildings in um, like a national firm. We have office in Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, and Perth. Um, and I just registered last year to become a registered architect. So it's like a direct line. And I, yeah, but 
I feel like the director line is I didn't got the time to explore other things, like things other than architecture. I was like always stick on architecture. And I'm actually a panel, I went to the same panel session with Peter four, four years ago, just before COVID. Um, and just after I graduated and found a job. And I still remember there's a student asking me, are you seeing yourself as an architect in the future? And back to the day, I said, well, no, um, I can't see any benefit of that. I mean, you don't have to do it. Um, because it's more because back to the day, my plan was to do concept design and more graphical things, because that's where I, I see myself is. So if you want to do that, you don't have to be an architect, because you, know, you don't have much liability as, as you need to do um, if you're doing the other documentation stuff. Um, but what happened is when I entered the firm, um, I am more deep down into documentation, tender, um, and to deliver the job and see how how a building job from paper and then turn into a concrete slab, and how does this concrete slab been approved and signed by an architect, and then it's become um, the panel that people fix it up on site and actually all these things holding up to a to an actual building, and then I. I then feel like, I don't know when, I don't know since when, but I changed my, like deep down, I changed a little bit. I feel like I'm a more, that kind of person is kind of concept design and graphical things. And then I, I, I want to be an architect. And yeah, that's, you can see that cute, like people's thoughts can be changed quite dramatically within several years of practice, even if my career is like a straight line, but it's like, like overall street, but if you look into that, it's a lot of different curves. Right, that's really interesting. And I think I've had quite a few changes in my career. And I think practice does change you when you go into a particular practice, you do get new ideas and new thoughts or about what you might want to do going forward. So I've got one question, but I'll ask you a bit later. Sonia, <clears throat> I'm glad we're sitting next to each other because mine feels like the opposite, anything but a straight line. Um, I'll try to get through this fast. <clears throat> the year is 2000. I finished high school in Dubai. There are no architecture schools in Dubai to study in. So chapter one of being an international student, sit the exam, clear the exam in Singapore. I did my bachelor's degree in Singapore and I have a particular talent for graduating in financial crises. So I graduated in 2003 with the Asian financial crisis and I really wish I had the luxury of targeting which firm I could work for. But when you graduate in a financial crisis, slightly limited options. So um, start working in a large firm, um, uh, get a you know good broad uh, spectrum of typologies to work in, in a very uh, short and intense period of time, intense with a capital I. Three years later, have hit burnout, decide architecture is bleep uh, and I am done with it um, and um, but there's this tiny voice in the back of my head going what if it's not the same everywhere so migration number two chapter number two of being an international student I then decide to shoot my last uh, shot of the hoop um, come to Melbourne Uni to do my masters um, again graduate in a financial crisis um, which is the 2008 financial crisis uh, at that point I was fortunate to be working part-time in a small practice and so from the last practice extreme start working in a small practice and was there for seven years and I can assure you starting my own practice was never part of the plan um, hit other roadblocks um, there which I will not go into detail because I know you can all look me up on LinkedIn but um, but uh, a chance conversation with a colleague when I decide that I'm again chapter two done with architecture profession and maybe academia is the one for me um, a, a colleague goes um, I'm leaving why are you still here and then a week later says, do you think we could? And um, that was the most beneficial lunchtime conversation I ever had with a colleague. Uh, we've now completed 10 years of our practice together and our practice is in Carlton just down the road. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, Rob, you, you've retrained from another profession. I, I did. I, um... And then went you also went to that hard, cruel school of RMIT. That's true. And then 
then went on to work on much bigger projects. Well, <clears throat> yes, I, I guess that's part of the story. I did start life um, in nursing as an intensive care specialist nurse. And I suppose um, that was one part of nursing that I felt I really belonged for a few years and I studied architecture during that time. And the thing that I've taken away is that apart from that health experience, which I think has affected my understanding of space and how it works in many ways that affects our health, our wellbeing, which is still a focus of mine now with research. But um, I, I used to walk away from the office sometimes and think, well, it can't be too bad. No one died here today. And it's, it's helped, helped me reflect upon, um, you know, there's always some tough days, uh, but, you know, I guess I got absorbed into a practice that I'd already been working with when I was a student as well, when I sort of was, was moving from the health industry across. And that was ARM and I got started working on some large projects with them early on and somehow got slotted into working with larger scheme projects, including with Williams and Bogue when Bogue was still here. Um, and, you know, there was the Monash Science Centre and other things like that. And then moved on into working with government and leading projects with government for the best part of 10 years as a design director within the Victorian government and um, working on a whole range of projects, many of which I'm not proud to have had anything to do with when I look around the city today. But um, that was a tremendous learning process. I went out back into architecture and worked um, as sector leaders for national firms and ultimately for one large um, sort of, in, in the word engineering was used, larger scale, uh, mixed practice of 7,000 people before they merged to become even larger. Back with other scale, smaller scale practices. So I've managed to see architecture from a number of different perspectives. And I think the other thing that's really, I enjoy of always through my career, been teaching and find that being here in the room with you guys is one of the most, um, interesting parts of what we do, how we distill ideas together, how we communicate, what opportunities we can create. And I am very much of the view of this panel that, um, of this panel about how we create strategies for ourselves from the earliest days at university, how we start to scale those, how we think of those opportunities and how we could grow them. So it's great to be on this panel with- All right, Michael, panel. let's come back to that strategy question your own career strategy, did that emerge over time or did you always want to be an architect at the beginning but you weren't quite sure how you were going to get there? And I think this is like three questions in one, I'm sorry. And then your experiences in um, Germany, how did that shape things for you? Um, I guess to take the questions chronologically, um, I did always want to be an architect. Yeah. Uh, since before I even knew what the word for architect was, I knew I wanted, I started, you know, making paddle pop stick houses and I thought I wanted to be a builder at that point. <laughs> um, and then we renovated our family home and I saw that the builder was just doing what had already been drawn, um, which is obviously a pretty simplistic way of looking at it. But, um, and I wanted to be the person who was coming up with the ideas. So it was always there for me. Um, in terms of my time in Germany, I think really the biggest impact it had on me was just seeing how people practice in other parts of the world. You know, Europe, particularly at that time, had a really strong competition-based um, design, uh, architectural practice culture. So that was how any practice started in, in Germany and over across Western Europe generally. You, um, you, ran, you, you started a practice by winning competitions and you ran a practice by winning competitions. Um, and so the practice I worked for over there as a student would churn out about 50 competitions a year. So, you know, about one a week, um, which was just you know, a huge, a huge kind of churn. Um, of ideas, but it also meant that the architecture had high, fairly high aspirations. Really different from um, really different from the way practices typically start in Australia. Um, you know, typically, I, th I think our practice probably fits the model, and I think BKK did as well. Um, and I think Stoughton Architects 
and workshop architecture did too, which is that you start by doing single residential work. You might start by doing, you know, um, somebody's laundry or bathroom fit out, and that might turn into a until I see some nodding down there, that might turn into an extension and then someone sees that you can do an extension so maybe you can do a house and you kind of gradually win the trust of the market that way. Um, so uh, Europe I think just showed me an, like just a, a different a different architectural culture and, and maybe an insight into another way of potentially operating if you wanted to. Um, I think, you know, Rory Hyde here at Melbourne Uni talks a lot about um, other ways about thinking about your career trajectory and into making your own opportunities. And he spent a lot of time in Europe around the similar time that I was in Berlin. And I, I suspect that probably had that kind of had an influence on his thinking around the way um, a practice or, a, or how a, a career can unfold. Um, yeah, and I think it is about unfolding of a career over time as you gain new experiences or new skills or new insights by being in different environments. So, Stephanie, why did you go from commerce to architecture? I mean, it's a bit of a, a jump. Yeah, I mean, I think unlike Michael, I didn't actually know what I wanted to do for a very long time and I spent most of my 20s trying to figure that out. Uh, and then I figured it out and then I had to work out how to actually do that because it was a big decision for me. I was earning a lot of money in banking uh, and then I had a baby and it seemed like a good time. It sounds completely insane now, I understand. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think, I mean, it was the best thing I ever did. It was one of the best changes. I don't think I realised. Choose architecture and not something else. Oh, uh, look, to be, to be... different to banking? To be fair, I mean, I, I thought about... I did think about it a lot. I did a lot of reflecting about what I love to do and I realised that I was interested in it and I used to obsessively buy a design maker. So the clues were there um, for a long time. Um, but, and it's interesting, you know, my dad was a um, was an engineering draftsman and my mother was a teacher and now I do educational architecture. So it seems like the writing was always on the wall, really. But um, yeah, I don't know, I think for some people it just takes longer. And I remember being really worried that I'd left my run too late. It was like, who would ever hire a 30-year-old? I'm so old, <laughs> which seems ridiculous now. Uh, so that was a big fear of mine. I think it's probably why, to be honest, and it shocks me now to realise this, I didn't have a career plan. I just wanted to start my degree and then I just wanted to get a job. I literally went for the first job that I saw. And then once I got into it, I started realising, okay, this is really good. Um, even then though, you know, I never thought I would start my own practice. I never thought I would be a director of practice and I've been a director of three now. So, you know, one thing I would say is that don't, don't get too caught up in your career about your idea of who you think you are. You know, I, th I thought I was very risk averse, which seems hilarious now to a lot of people who know me. Um, but that's who I thought I was. I thought I was risk averse. I thought I wasn't the sort of person to put myself out there. I certainly didn't think I'd be on chapter council. You know, allow yourself to evolve into the person you can become would be so my you advice. you really evolve from being a traditional mindset, risk averse banker to an architect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Take risks. And to, to start a practice. I mean, we um, started the practice seven years ago. We now have 24 people. You know, we do projects ranging for 5 million to 200 million. So, you know, and again, I didn't plan any of that. I'm as surprised as anybody, to be honest. But, you know, I guess I would say allow things to unfold sometimes in ways that you might not anticipate. And it's, it's shocking to hear myself say that because I love planning stuff. I love a spreadsheet. I have five-year goals, I have all of that, but I can honestly say that my career has not unfolded in any way that I planned. Sweet G, now that you're registered and now that you're, like, I assume the things that you've been doing on that sort of delivery documentation side, that would have helped you in terms of registration because not everyone gets that experience. But now that you're registered, what do you want to do now? To be honest, I'm not quite sure. I feel like after you registered, it's coming to a new whole world that I start to think about, do I want to do doing residential? Because I've been keeping, keep on doing that for five years and I know that I'm pretty good at it. But should I try something else or education or hospitality? I'm not quite sure. And um, 
and I talk to my colleagues, and I feel like a lot of people after registered, they have the same question in heart, like, it feels like a big stone finally falling down, and then it's time to think about, should I move on, or I just keep on with what I'm doing? Um, I'm still struggling, and don't let my Karen firm know, but um, I'm not sure if you ask me the answer. And then I start to think about my, um, like the whole architecture education recently, because um, when I prepare my registration last year, I actually looked back to my notes, back to uni when I study architectural practice, when I got the chance to know how to set up a firm from beginning, because that's the things I'm lacking in the big firm. Like you never got the chance to set up a brief or you know exactly what the clients need because the firm is too big and they have specific people doing that block. So I don't have that experience. And my experience back to uni, that's become my only source. And um, then I, like back to uni, I was always fa focused on design. Like I feel like architecture is all about design back to the day. But when I come to reality, you're gonna realize it's a lot of design might be the, I'm not saying it's the last important, but it's not, it's not the very front um, elements that you may looking at when it's coming to real project. And, um, it's not, sorry, I feel like I'm being far away. Um, I just been recently thinking about the whole process of education and what you grow in the past, like architectural practice, that, that class, or what I learned from that class, back to the day, I didn't really take that quite seriously, to be honest. I feel like it's just assignment. But after you graduate for five years and when you do the registration and looking back and have to find out your notes back to the day, it feels like what I I put a seat there and now it's the time I, I see that seat actually become something. I feel like my education works in a way. Like the fancy design that I pursued back to uni, it helps me to holding up the like the system of architecture, but it's not or most of the cases not what gonna happen in the real firm. Um, yeah, so I'm on the edge of thinking about should I keep on doing what I'm doing right now or just think a bit more back and then moving forward, so. I got it. And thank you for saying those nice things about architectural practice. Um, <clears throat> Sonia, now what about I mean, maybe does everyone have that, I mean, I think I did at one point, had that confrontation between the ideals of wanting to be a designer or design ideals suddenly and brutally confronted with reality. Um, has that been your experience between design and having to run a practice and? Um, well, to answer that specific question. Um, in the first chapter where I worked for a large practice, there was no such brutality because you actually didn't even get to see the projects realized. You were, you know, you were often isolated in the design and, you know, competition end of things. So that reality check didn't come in that chapter. Um, in the small practice chapter, I think it wasn't so much the design and reality, it was practice and reality. You know, you're sold often at uni this particular one version um, of practice. And um, as I said, um, not having the choices sometimes of, of the, which practice you would like to work for often means you get to see a lot of what you really don't want to do. But the good thing is you actually learn, wow, there's actually so many different ways to practice. So the reality check was more to do with practice rather than design versus other aspects yeah um, on site but if I can come back to the earlier question on um, um, strategy and and whether I wanted to be an architect um, it's good to be further down the line because I can answer and echo some of the things you've said so I wanted to be an architect since I was eight um, atrocious modeling skills but I can design my I can sketch my way out of most problems uh, no architect in the family for miles so I duped my poor parents by saying engineering yeah architecture is kind of like that so that's how I managed to convince uh, my family that architecture was a thing um, but in terms of strategy I really want to echo what Stephanie said which is um, you 
absolutely, you know, have one, sure. But do not, because my career has been left and right and so many things, do not be so focused on that that you do not keep your eyes and ears open to something else that comes your way. Do not put blinkers on when you've got that strategy. Be open constantly. And the other thing is, you have a strategy that you set at a particular point in time, and you know that's a career strategy, but your career strategy needs to incorporate a life strategy too. And that's where all the twists and turns come. So um, be willing to change direction and be open to opportunities that may emerge is probably the strategy that I've taken and that I've often seen that when my, um, the, the people I've mentored over the years, when they've done that, when they've had that openness to take in those left and right turns, I think that's when they felt that they have by fate or design landed up in the spot that they kind of never thought that they would be in, but that they're truly happy that they did. Was that all the questions? Hi. I'll pass on. Rob, what, what do you want to say to people about how they might strategize their career? I think um, all of you have had, you know, answered the question about why you want to be here. You've, you've all got something driving you. And now it's time to think a bit, perhaps a bit more deeply about what you'd like to offer, what springs from that. I know that design was always a huge, you know, even though I did the, the nursing career, um, before that I knew I wanted to do architecture and I was also practising as an artist and had a few shows. Very interested in design, led for a number of years, but quickly got absorbed into doing larger scale work and working and leading teams. But that was, I think, part of what you were saying, Peter, always a battle. I mean, you're always advocating for design the quality of design, what it offers. It's, there's always a bit of a battle on about that, particularly as you negotiate um, design with a number of players or, or, or um, policy makers or actually um, partners and stakeholders in projects. And you cannot not be passionate about it, but at the same time, you can't be blind about the fact that there is a game of give and take along the way as well. So. Um, at, at the moment, if I'm sitting in your chair um, and, and trying to put myself back there, I'm thinking, well, I knew that design was a huge influence on my life and that I wanted to be in some of those best companies doing that work. But as I also had the experience of getting out there, I realised it was something around the community interface. Learning back from clients was actually, after a few years, I realised that actually listening to clients gave us the energy of something that we couldn't otherwise do on our own. And that became a bigger and bigger thing for me and as an opportunity to respond to. Because if you do something, I realise the same way a number of times, it starts to look the same. And you know what needs to be done and it becomes like a sausage machine. Well, um, but if we stop and listen to what the community offers, and we never have enough time in the short period we have to do it, but to, t to absorb what their interests and needs are, something else can emerge from that. And I've found that to be, you know, really exciting. Um, and which we don't have time enough to do, um, and particularly around what community infrastructure can mean for us as well in terms of the research that I'm involved in now. But it, it was all, um, I guess, triggered by the vast amount of interest and design can offer but as a starting point. But it steps on from that to really impact with the lives of people, with the people around us that we work with and the people who obviously um, pay for us. Um, and I guess that I think is a dynamic which is, I'm sure, brewing within you guys. St a strategy means you deciding maybe up to one, two, three, four points of direction that you feel you really want to go. And I think if you start to write them down or think them through, write the story to yourself. Um, I remember being back in my career doing that at one stage of my career and I thought it'd take six or nine months to get there when it only took two or three months once I'd actually written that down. So I think engaging with that, that passion that you have to put you in the seats where you are now and then to think about all the different sectors that you could be engaged in, and there's such an array of them now, that things you're most passionate about, I think, can drive you forward from there. But also um, having a bit of a, of a not too deep, I think it was great what you said, Sonia, about things opening up as you go. But once you go through that door and once, you know, 
you start to have those interactions, I think that's when, you know, a lot of what you've been looking for starts to flourish and let that happen. And I think um, it doesn't just happen though. You really do have to put yourself sometimes in some tricky spots to make sure you have that, as Alan in our previous panel was talking about the network, the communications with Charlotte. Yeah, we might get on to that. And I think writing down those points or trying to articulate strategy, it's almost like having your own, dare I say it, business plan. But I think you do need to do that in terms of your career at some point. Now we might have some questions and um, then more conversation. So does anyone... Yes. I'm Sam. I have a question for Sonia and Michael both. I understand you, you both have practices, but it seems like you started slightly differently. Maybe in your case, a little bit more of that lunchtime conversation, but it was always your plan, Michael. I'd like to know what do you think was in you that resulted in you wanting to run your own practice? What about you led to that? Yeah. Um, funny, I was, on a, I was on a panel once where that question was asked of everyone and I realised as I was listening to all the other answers that I'd never actually stopped to think about it. It was like just something I'd assumed I'd do. And I think that's because um, both my biological parents and both my step parents all worked for themselves. <laughs> so I think there's like something of the culture of just where I'd come from or something. Uh, they were, yeah, they were all kind of independent operators in that sense. Um, but it's really interesting. Like, I don't, I don't think everybody should try. I, th I think sometimes there's this idea in architectural education that's held up that you need to be a certain kind of architect. And I think we've kind of heard today that there are so many different, so there are so many different skills that make up being an architect and so many skill sets that architectural practice requires. And we need so many different kinds of operators. And some of those operators, uh, thriving and doing incredible work within other people's practices. Some people are starting their own thing because that's the, the way their minds work. It's where they do their best work. But I've seen, I've seen many of my peers that I studied with um, work in established practices, and by this stage, you know, they've risen up through the ranks. They've become partners or directors. Um, and they haven't needed to reinvent the wheel. They haven't had to cut their pay in half. Um, <laughs> they haven't had to go through um, some of the pains that you do experience in, in starting in, in, a new practice, um, but they've landed in a spot where nevertheless they're still leading projects, whatever that means to them, whether that's the design side or um, the procurement side or um, you know, the construction side or whatever it might be. Yeah, so I, I think there, are, I think there, are, there are so many different career paths that you can take as an architect, and and yeah, not to not to have your mind set on on one of them is a good idea. Um, also, to what Steph said earlier about um, being conscious of the thing that makes you different from the next architect, I think is is really important to keep in mind. Um, we we I. Th before doing architecture, there's every likelihood that many of you in this room probably had some kind of creative practice or creative interest um, before uh, you started trying to design buildings. Um, I always encourage the students I've taught to get back to those things and get back to them soon. Architecture school can be so all-consuming um, that you stop doing those things. I found myself coming back to them only after I finished architecture school. The sooner you get back to them, the better. They're the things that make you unique as a designer, unique as an architect, changes, uh, makes your perspective different from the next person's, also makes life uh, generally more, more, more enjoyable to be you know, pursuing those things that, that drove you, that you'll find that, um, that, that those interests ignite your architecture and, and vice versa. And also, I think generally just pursuing the things that excite you tends, tend to lead you to where you want to be, you know, by plan or otherwise. And it's incredible how opportunities often arise out of just pursuing um, uh, you know, a very innocent interest in a thing for its own sake. Um, 
I won't talk about my own kind of my own interests or experience in those things, but um, you, you find yourself making connections with like-minded people, which opens up doors to certain kinds of work and just like literally it sounds so twee but just like really f like follow follow the, the things that light you up um and and you don't really have to do much more than that um does that answer your question sonia did you want to add to that sorry yeah. sonia thanks michael it's all right so, uh, hi sam good. good to see you um so uh, it's always good to get this variety of panel. Well done, Peter, to curate this because it's quite different. Um, no business person in my family for miles, absolutely terrified at the thought of going into, I, have, I would never entertain sole practice for sure. Um, perhaps definitely having a co-director gave me some courage. But um, what I, what gave me that, that planted that seed that germinated over that lunchtime conversation was realizing that over my other experiences, both in a large practice where I was siloed in certain stages and a small practice where I was given a bit more rain in, in stages and uh, not typologies, but stages. So I could see stuff from beginning to end and had some level of ownership was actually realizing that I actually had more skill sets than just that. And that design wasn't the only thing that fired me up and that I actually love thinking about the business side of things. I love actually sitting down and negotiating with, you know, um, a, a prickly builder or a prickly council. I actually didn't ever imagine that I would enjoy those things. And so when that seed germinated over that week, it was the realization that actually I could fulfill all these other things that were, were skill sets that I su was surprised to discover that I do have and that I could get that spectrum um, by going into practice. The other thing was also it bought me the luxury to pursue interests that perhaps convention, most conventional practices wouldn't allow me to. Um, and so by crafting my own with my co-director Michael, I could go down those alleyways kind of like how Michael was saying. So there's some overlaps over there with Michael, but you know, we landed up at the same point with, from very different routes. And again, not with any assumption that it was the gold star for me or anything. It just felt like the avenue to fulfill my potential that I and was surprised some, to discover. In the same way that Michael came from a family of like lone wolf individual business people, were there people in your family who are really good at negotiations and, and those kinds Actually, of now that you come to think of it, yes. <laughs> One side of my family is lawyers, wall to wall. Of course. Grandpa, thank you. <laughs> so they were negotiators. Anyone? Um, thank you. Any other questions? I'm just wondering, like, what's the process of being a uh, be, to be a registered architect because when I actually browse through the AACA website that uh, we are required to submit our logbook, have an exam and interview as well. I'm not sure if that's correct. That is correct. And, I feel like um, it's a question for me. <laughs> no, I think, yeah, Sweet Chi can do it. I think they actually just about to change the way you got registered. Um, starting from this year, actually, um, what we did up to last year, you correct, we need to submit the logbook, which you need to prove that you have enough experience through all the phases that required um, from uh, from town planning, um, brief schematic design, and into documentation and how it's been how the project been produced into construction. So all phases that you need to provide that you meet um, three, I think it's 3,000 hours requirement. Um, and then um, it's a statement basically says which are the project you'll be working on and what you faced during that specific one. And then the, um, the and then after that, after you submit all this, you went to part two, which is the actual exam. Um, if you pass the exam, you went to enter the interview phase. And then, yeah, if you pass all three, then congratulations, you architect. Now, it's a three-part process, and I'm not sure if you've done architectural practice here, but we do cover that, like, at the very beginning of the subject to get the Architects Registration Board to come in and um, talk about it. So I think a bit of advice would be if you're working, start doing your logbooks now and early and you know maybe 
do some of the other courses, post-professional courses that are around, the PELS course or the PARC course, and they will also help you prepare. Did you do any of those courses, Sweet Chi, or did you do it all yourself? Um, I did PARC. You did PARC? Yeah. yeah. Um, and another... And your thumbs up from Sonia. Thank you for <laughs> PARC. Um, and I think another tip for the people that who want to be an architect, I feel like it's a pretty good hobby and it helps you if you want to find another job and it helps you in, during the interview is um, while you're doing the project, trying to write down or this or try to somehow remember the difficulties or the challenges you faced when solving the problem. And then because what happened is can, one project can last two or three years. And after that, after those times, you may don't remember what happened on that project. And if an interviewer asks you, you it's, it's pretty difficult to understand that. Um, but one, I don't know if that's a bad example or good example. I had a, some, some kind of argument with my interviewer when I was doing my exam. So I was like, please don't feel me after that. But somehow I passed. Um, so it's better, like, it's not always a bad thing to have argument with the interviewer. I'm not saying it's good, but um, just the more prepared you are, the more you understand the project, the better. Because um, they might have certain insect of maybe the, they, because they may, they may work for government for several years and they say like, this thing is not gonna pass because it's not, meets the requirement, blah, 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 and that you can somehow have your own argument. It's not a bad thing, but you need to be very prepared and know your project so well that they can't, yeah, they can't say no. You, you will be the expert on the projects that you've worked on when faced with um, interview questions. Now, there's one up the back. Uh, hi. I basically wanted to know everybody's relationship with money. Um, did any of you ever have to sort of put your passion aside to make a decision that was more financially driven? Or how often does that come up? Especially like all of us do have thoughts about, well, if I was something else, I could have made a lot more money at different stages of our life. So um, was any of your careers driven by those sort of decisions? Uh, I can answer that. So um, that was probably, the big decision for me when I was in banking. And I remember very clearly deciding that I would probably never earn as much money in architecture as I did when I was in banking and I was okay with that. Um, and until relatively recently, that was true. It did take quite a long time, but, um, but that was my choice. And, you know, I went from earning a lot of money um, to earning $10 an hour as a student <laughs> at the time um, was the wage. So it was, yeah, a tiny fraction of what I was. And, and I, I, that was my choice and I decided to do that. And I think, you know, part of it was that I, I decided that meaning was more important than money. And also I have a belief that I believe in abundance as well. So I do believe that, that if you back yourself um, and if you have an idea around abundance and generosity, that the money will come. Um, I can't promise that will happen, but that's certainly been my experience of it. I guess um, the other thing I would say that is in terms of practice, when you run a practice, you're making decisions about money all the time. Uh, we regularly turn down work um, that might be very lucrative and we're lucky to be able to do that, particularly in the current market. But in the end, it's never a good idea to take on a project just for the money, in my experience. It always ends in tears. So that is one thing that I think you need to to really stick to if you're ever in a position where you need to make those decisions. If it, um, if it is just for the money, don't do it. If it doesn't have meaning, it's not worth it ever. And when you're in practice, correct me if I'm wrong, you're constantly making those money decisions constantly. on a daily basis. And, Abs and absolutely. You, you know, I think either to try and maximise the design outcomes on a particular project related to money and your fees, or to just survive, I guess. Completely. And if I can just say one more thing in terms of advice, you need to be financially literate. It doesn't matter what you want to do in terms of your career as an architect, whether you think you're going to run a business or whether you're going to work in a business or if you're going to work your way up in a business, financial literacy is freedom. So if there is one area that you should upskill yourself in, it is that. 
you know, and it might be the very basic things of understanding, you know, how to read a balance sheet, you know, what does a profit and loss in, and I'm assuming, I'm hoping this is probably covered in, in professional practice, but it still shocks me that people don't know that. They don't know what a dividend is. It's you know. not covered anymore. Okay. Because the, um, it's not in the competencies anymore. So right. it's so, gone. So perhaps if you do start in a practice, ask questions in terms of, um, you know, that is something, if you can find a practice that is willing to be transparent about that and share that with you, it's an incredibly important part of your career development would be my advice. Previously in our practice subject, we did business plans, which was a great thing. I mean, Sweet Chi would have done one. Um, Sonia would have done one, was great. But with the introduction of the new competencies, which we need to teach to, they just crowded them out. Nothing, in, you look at the competencies, there's nothing in them about business planning, which involves, you know, financial modelling or whatever, or how you might actually do a business plan. I mean, it's kind of criminal. But let's, let's, <laughs> Sonia. If I can add and jump into that question. Um, I inadvertently, not realising it, made that choice at the start of my career, not knowing that, which is working for the large practice, um, getting paid actually reasonably well. It sounds like a miracle now, but they actually gave out bonuses to all staff at the end of the year. But it was not worth it when I was going home every day a shell of myself and I had nothing to give myself to the other parts of my life. So yes, I kind of, I didn't realize I was making that bargain, but I made that bargain and I saw the price I paid. Um, and so um, also uh, having come from uh, two generations above me, family of very, very limited means, it's very interesting to see that it's not the amount of money you have, it's what how you build your life and what you do with the amount that you earn, right? Um, because you can earn a lot and you can squander a lot. So financial literacy, 100% back that point. Yeah, <laughs> you can do a lot with, with less if you are very savvy and financially literate. Um, on, currently, um, my, my partner works in an industry that definitely remunerates him better than what I, uh, the architecture industry remunerates. And I can still tell you there's, there's a lot more days where he's envious of me than I am of him um, because that, that extracts a price at, you know, in a different way. Uh, yeah. Now, I think we might end there because I know some of you have been here for many hours and I think our panel has really given us some very intense and personal insights into their own careers. So, and there's, look, there's many more things I'd like to talk about like mentoring, networks and all that sort of thing, but we might leave them till next time. So I think a big round of applause for our panel. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for coming. We're hoping that these will be regular events in the future for our graduates. So I think if you've enjoyed it tonight, tell your friends to come along next time and we hope, hope it's been helpful to you. So thank you everyone. Thank you James. Thank you Susan. Thank you Paul Walker whose wonderful idea this was. Um, and um, we'll see you around. So thank you. <laughs>